Welcome back to another episode of the Normal to Nomad podcast. Cheers. Today, we talk about making money and how we made money in the past before Scamp Life, during Scamp Life, now, and our plans for the future. Should be interesting. We'll start before Scamp Life, how we were making money and kind of the jobs that we were doing before moving into our trailer. Neither of us were doing anything very elite, I guess I would say. We weren't making big bucks by any means. I, during college, had a couple video production jobs, and then right after college, I started face painting as an event face painter. And that was pretty good money, good tip money and stuff. I had a lot of cash. But not like a lot of cumulative money, just cash. No, never a Bank salary. Bank account wasn't giant. But. I've never had a salary before, a full nine to five salary job. I've always been a contractor doing whatever work I'm doing. Except at KU you had, I guess that was hourly too. Hourly, yeah. Yeah. And I had a number of different odd jobs and stuff prior to when we met. But then when we met, I believe I was working at a sporting goods store called Backwoods. I got a lot of like gear oriented experience and learned a lot about selling stuff to people and learned a lot about the gear through that. And then I collected a good bit of the gear that we still use today in that job. We always say now that if anyone is trying to enter this lifestyle, if you before doing the lifestyle or as you are living the lifestyle, working at a gear shop is a great way to load up on gear for your rig. Yeah. And to figure out what all you need and how different things work for different applications and stuff. After that, I got into web development and selling websites and did that for a long time first to used car dealerships. We just walked into a used car dealership and sold them a website that was a WordPress template. You and a buddy. Yeah. And um, I did that for a while and did some consulting work in that arena too, which was interesting. It was a really good jumping off point for me to get into web development. And why that? Because it was kind of a gnarly. Yeah, it was really gnarly working with car dealers because there's, there's, I don't know, A lot of the stereotypes for used car dealerships, I believe, are true in my experience. Um, But my buddy sold cars, and his dad had a consulting agency in uh, the car sales arena. So he was like, well, this is something that these dealerships are paying loads of money for, and if we can find a way to produce it ourselves, then they would jump all over it. So... That's how we got into that. And we would make like a Google spreadsheet. We'd look through all the different car dealerships in the area and look at them on Google Maps. And if they had a website listed, we wouldn't go visit them unless it was like a terrible website. But we'd list all the ones that didn't have a website. And then we would make like a route. And we would just go all day long, door to door in the car dealerships trying to sell websites. And it actually worked surprisingly well. So we didn't make a ton of money. The first website we sold was for 50 bucks a month and a hundred dollars on the spot. And they just gave us cash over a handshake. And then they were our client until we stopped doing it. So I don't know. It was crazy. Great but way to get experience yeah. learning how to sell yourself yeah. to people. Cause I'm not good at that. That was part of what my buddy was good at is sales. And I was just like, yeah, we can make this. Here you go. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah, that was interesting, but I did that for quite a while, and then consulting and that kind of thing, too. And then you did a more uh, professional version of that with a different friend Yeah. after that. He, my friend was more designer-oriented, and then I was the developer, so we would do like branding and build websites and stuff for primarily startups and different companies uh, throughout that time, and that was super fun. I was primarily a front-end developer. Uh, before that, and then we got into different things where I had to learn to tie them into APIs and backends and stuff. But I got really good at working with Shopify, which is a e-commerce platform. So I built a number of, like when businesses were starting up, I would handle their, both their like point of sale system through Spotify and their online retail space. So then they could sell things with credit cards and everything in the flesh and then online too. So it was, I don't know, like, a decade ago before I was doing it, that would be a like hundreds of do- hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that sort of system all dialed. But then 
with Shopify, we could spin it up and charge them upward, like up to 10 grand, up to 15, you know, depending on the time and everything and then get it rolling. So yeah, just living in the future. One of the things too, that we would offer at the used car dealerships is back in the day, Google drive. So like your word and spreadsheets and all those things and your email, if you registered your domain and then pointed your like mail servers to Google drive, it used to be free. So everybody that we'd set up, I would get on their computer and like clear out all the crap. Cause everybody, if you open a um, task manager on someone's computer that doesn't know anything about computers, it's just like totally bogged down. So we would just clean up their computers, install Chrome on it, and then ha- hook them up with Google drive. And they thought we were just like, geniuses but like all we did was put chrome on their computer and log into drive and then everything was all synced for them and everything so if you've never done something like that that is pretty genius yeah and then we got into like we would go to micro center which is the local computer store and get like a low-end pretty cheap computer and sell that to them and install all of our new stuff on it primarily because if we were working on their computers and like trying to help them and they had like an ancient machine it was just miserable for us to work on it. So it was like better to hook them up with something new, but I don't know. It was all, I learned a ton. It was pretty interesting doing all that. Why did you stop? Um, I don't know. My buddy that I was working with kind of got more into working with a company specifically, Alpha Clothing Co. And I don't know, we just kind of phased out of it. And at that point too, I was working on the watches. I had a luxury watch brand with a friend that we like 3D printed all the prototypes and built a brand around and everything. And that was pretty neat for a time. And then money got involved and everything got a little squirrely and I got pushed out of it. But I'm glad that I did because it was definitely not a passion of mine. It was just kind of a means to an end, I guess. It was so luxury that the... It wasn't the... Intent was to make these relatively cheap watches and sell them for very expensive. And didn't one of them, Bill Self, KU football? Yeah. We, <laughs> basketball. KU, yeah, he had one. The So, um, not Ben Horowitz, it's Andr- Andreessen, Mark Andreessen bought one from us, which was pretty cool. He's like the founder of Netscape and there but was this whole, yeah. Didn't Bill Self's break I'm during sure. a game? Yeah, and now that it's no, the company is no longer so I can kind of talk more about it. But, it was so we had these, it was when 3D printers were kind of coming into vogue. So you could get a 3D printer for pretty cheap or you could go use one for pretty cheap. So we had a, um, where was he? Um, I can't remember where he was from. But we had a designer in another country that would like do the engineering design for the watch cases. And then he would send us that and then we would make a file to run it on a 3D printer and print out the watch cases to like prototype them. And then we would get a movement, like a Swiss mechanical movement, which is a nice movement that you pay a lot for, but you can get them just a movement itself without any hands or a face on it for pretty affordable, a couple hundred bucks. So we would get the movements shipped in and we would, we would 3D print the cases initially to like get a feel for what they were going to be like. And then we started working with Gorilla Glass to get the glass because we, we like sandwiched two pieces of glass or one piece of glass in the case with the movement inside and then the other piece of glass on the bottom. So you could see the mechanical movement, like doing all of its stuff. So that was really Mm. neat. But, um, like I had no experience assembling watches and we were putting these watches together, uh, with like the faces that we were Cerakoting and we would sandwich the Cerakoted faces too. So you would take like one thin circular piece of metal We would run it through a laser etcher, like we had, we hired a laser etcher to like run through a bunch of faces for us. And then you would just put that on top of the other face. So then it was like a sort of, it had depth to it, the numbers Mm -hmm. and stuff. And I would assemble them just like on a desk building watches for a while. And then we were selling those for a lot more than they were worth. But that's kind of why we got into the watch industry is because we could but we knew how to build brands really well and market and like there's tons of margin in the luxury watch industry because it's kind of a joke. So we just leveraged that and it worked for a little while. 
But then you didn't have any money to invest. Right. Because like, I was like. You weren't getting paid from this. No. It was it was just like a fun project for me. It was a way to use some of the skills that I had The honed. goal was to get paid eventually. Eventually. But by the time, once we started making money, then they like schemed against me and kicked me out of it. Like as soon as we started with selling watches, which I was pretty upset about at that point because it was like I'd put so much time into this, but it ended up working out because we got into a lot more interesting things and they kind of didn't, so. And that was, you took so much from that in learning about how to start up a business like that and then that experience has kind of come into our lives over and over again. Yeah. Do we want to do something like that? Right. No, I don't think so. I already right. did that in Kansas City. Startup mentality isn't exactly where where we wanted to be yeah. personally. Yeah, because a lot of and working with a lot of startups, it was a lot of their interest was, okay, let's kick this thing off, get a minimum viable product going, then get a bunch of investors, and then get bought out. So it was like really, uh, I, it felt vain to me. Because it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of long-term sort of sustainable goals, not even in like an ecologically sustainable way, but just like to sustain momentum. It was like, like a flash in the pan type of deal. There were a lot of people in our circles doing startup stuff. That's just Kansas City, at least at that time, was startup, big, big, Do you big know startup. Why? Uh-uh. It was because Kansas City was one of the pla- first places to get fiber. Google Fiber went to Kansas City first. So a lot of startups were looking at ways to leverage that like crazy bandwidth and late, low latency to, um, I don't know, spin their new startup. That's very smart. Yeah. But yeah, that was fascinating. I'm glad that it didn't totally work out because a lot of the things we're doing are far more interesting. It is an interesting space, though, the startup community. And that almost was just, I mean, that's where we grew up and that's where we were and that's what we were familiar with. So we were getting involved in that scene pretty heavily. Yeah. And then we didn't do that anymore. Yeah. So then you got into, at that point, you had been doing like some design work, but it was mostly face painting and you were doing like side hustle stuff during that, right? I had gone, I went my final year in college, I took a stage makeup class because I needed one more elective to graduate. And I've told this story a bunch of times, but I couldn't take photography because that was in the school of journalism and I was in the school of liberal arts and sciences. So I, I, I could take stage makeup and thought, okay, well, this would be fun. And people were getting into the scene online, posting stuff on Reddit and some YouTube videos and stuff of face paint, body paint. So I thought, I'll do it. And I started it and I did that. Right after college, I went viral for doing a White Walker face paint. From Game of Thrones. And I painted eyes on top of my eyes, and I'm sure people had done that before, but it was pretty cool to have not seen that very often. And Almost just, never. I mean, I... Like on YouTube and stuff, I feel like you were one of the first to do that. In the past, I've said for sure I was the first, but who knows? I don't know. Yeah. At the time, I definitely was very confident that I was, but you never know. I don't know. I... It, and it was crazy, like that video going viral, when it got 100,000 views in like a few weeks, it was like, that oh was hyper. God. We've we've hit it big. Yeah. Baby. Yeah. But it didn't really do anything like no. monetarily. But. I just got to be on the news and in the newspaper and I was on Ashton Kutcher's blog. I was on the front page of Reddit. An imager. Smosh, uh, their blog. The Daily Post, like all kind, I went very much viral, like very much viral. But it's interesting how, like, wasn't it? It still doesn't probably have a million views, does it, or does it? The White Walker. Yeah, I don't know. I think it got demonetized because it was so much of my face paint work has been demonetized because it's deemed as sexual content. That's so obnoxious. Yeah, I'm. I think you can find it though. There's. My most viewed video is a Chief's jersey body paint, and that was demonetized. We painted on her back the whole video, and they declared it sexual. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. It is but what it is. When I, whenever there were a few times that videos went 
viral or really got a lot of steam and really picked up on Reddit or whatever. And to get 100,000 views was insane. But now if we don't get 100,000 views on a video in the first couple of weeks, it's kind of a bummer. It is pretty fascinating how the bar has shifted. Yeah, the gold post just keeps climbing. And it's, I don't know, I think it's important to not chase that in that manner, but it's hard not to sometimes. But the reason I think that my, if you look back now, my body paint and face paint stuff was not that great. But I was one of the first in the scene on YouTube making videos of it. And I was making stop motion videos of basically the paint being painted onto me across the video. And then by the end of the video, 30 second video, it's all painted. Like you would crop out your brush strokes. Right. I'd take a, I would paint myself, take a picture, paint myself, take a picture, paint myself, take a picture, and then put that all together. And it was so much fun because I love the tedious nature of things like that. I love making stop motion videos. I want to get back into, like even with your watercolor or something, I think it'd be really cool to start doing more stop motion again. It's fun. It's a creative exercise that's not very easy. Yeah. Even to work like little stop motion blips into our videos would be cool. Mm-hmm. But then from there, I was taken a little bit more seriously by a face paint company that I ended up working for. I had no confidence in myself, but I had gone viral on the internet. So they hired me and they saw potential in me. And I'd go to church events, school events, whatever. And the company that I worked for, they I think they're SA Entertainment now in Kansas City, Sister Act Entertainment they are some of the best face painters I've ever seen. There's a bigger scene for face paint now with the internet. They would tell me that what they used to do when they were 20 years ago going to face paint events is they just paint a little smiley face or stars or something on the cheek. And now I'm sure all of you have seen it. Beautiful, realistic looking cats and dogs and sparkly princess crowns. It's incredible what people do with face paint now. Incredible. That and was a really cool gig for you. I know. I got to work with incredibly talented artists and learn from them. And it was just mostly a bunch of moms. And so I'd go kick it with a bunch of moms and paint a bunch of little kids. And for us, like you weren't making buku money, but for us, it was a lot of money to have that kind of like a few times a week, you would just go in and bring back several hundred dollars. Yeah, that was unreal. A weekend. Yeah, it was killer. And it was mostly in cash. So when we moved into the scamp, I had, I think, like an old peanut butter jar full of cash, 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 cash. And it was awesome. And then it went away <laughs> because we weren't making very much money at all Yeah, moving into the scamp. And then when we moved into the scamp, I had a few web development clients that I had like retainers with that I was still getting paid by and still doing work for. And then as we lived in the scamp and met new people, I had a few new clients and I, that's kind of how I was making money then. At the time, I think I was making maybe $100 a month on YouTube from my face and body paint work being monetized. I had monetized, I think YouTube began doing that in 2013 or 14 or 15 maybe. And I jumped on that really quickly. So I was bringing in a little bit of money on YouTube and the whole point of, I, the, it was always the plan to try to make the scamp something that we could do on YouTube. Always the plan because it was working, currently making money off of YouTube. And van life was kind of beginning to be a thing at that point, mm -hmm. I think, or maybe there were a few people, but I don't remember like a lot of it going on at that point. We didn't, definitely no scamp trailers. No. And we didn't um, know if it would be our number one source of income. I had switched from body paint into more digital art. I started getting into graphic design on an iPad, using Procreate to do logo work and beer label designs. Anything We were really trying to pivot into, um, as long as we have internet, we can work from anywhere type of mentality. And that worked. And I mean, that wasn't just a thing that we thought of when we moved into the scam. Yeah, after. Yeah, it was like that it was something we were working on getting our income to be mobile for years before that, like listening to the four hour work week and mm -hmm. um, lots of Tim Ferriss podcasts and trying to figure out the digital nomad sort of 
idea and how we were going to be able to execute on that. It wasn't like, okay, we moved into this camp, so let's like get everything to be portable. We had been like grinding on that for a long time. And it wasn't, we weren't trying to seek out this digital nomad lifestyle either. We weren't trying to go out and just travel a bunch. We just wanted to be able to afford to live, to be able to afford to be in cool places. We, we knew we wanted to move to Colorado, so we wanted to go live in Colorado for a bit. And jobs and work just kind of flowed naturally. That was part of it too, was the more time that we had by not going to work, going to a nine to five, we had a lot of time because we didn't have as many expenses to pay for. So we were able to devote our time instead to the crafts and things that we wanted to do. So Baron helped me set up a website for my um, stickers and I started selling, oh, is that a bald eagle? What is that? No, it's a no, it's crow, a it has something in its mouth. Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. I saw an owl yesterday. During the day? It was in the evening and I was Marco Poloing Christy and Zach uh -huh. and they got mad at me saying, you didn't flip the camera around. <laughs> but they just fly so quick and then they're gone. See, it's going back again. Yeah. But that to say, we just started making more money off of our crafts because we were dedicating our time to the things that we wanted to do, like the graphic design and stuff. So we started getting really good at our passions and then those ended up making us more money. And one of the entry points for that was the wood sticker business. Because our friends that worked at the Woodsticker, and I actually built them a website too, or like modernized their website. I forgot about that. But they printed stickers for us, and then that became almost our primary income for a while. Oh, Wood I forgot stickers. about murals. I painted yeah, a mural yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, you painted a mural for them. Mm hmm yeah, we actually were working with them. I forgot that we were working with them while we were like popping in and out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really cool people. But yeah, the then the sticker business kind of became more income than just about anything else. Mm -hmm. Like it was definitely more than YouTube because at that point YouTube was like we were stoked if we made a few hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was At amazing. that point, it was like, Right? If we made like 400 bucks, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah. you two made 400 bucks. I mean, because that went a long way. Right. Living right. the way that we did. Yeah. And then slowly YouTube gained momentum. And we did stickers after, I mean, all thanks to Dust City for making that a reality. We did the wood stickers because it was the only business and merch thing that we could do that would fit in a tub that we could drive and carry with us in our tiny little scamp. So I'd sit on the bed, lay out all my stickers, get my printer and my labels and everything and package a bunch of stickers, then take them to the post office. And I even said I only package stickers once a week because I just couldn't. It I didn't have a big have production to do yeah, that. Yeah, it was huge. It was a big deal. And over time, especially as the YouTube channel got bigger, um, more and more and more orders happened and... I've since given the all the stickers to my mom who lives in Kansas City and she ships them out for me and now she can do it all the time whenever people order. So that's nice. But it was also like we're traveling all the time. Trying to find a post office to drop stickers off at was a constant. It was stressful. That was tough. But it was the only way we could do it and no, it was it awesome. Was, yeah, it was incredible. Like it, it was perfect. Mm -hmm. But it was tough to get all those packaged. And I remember plenty of times being at coffee shops and we'd like bring our tub in and just have this whole printer and everything going. And right we'd there. frequent the same coffee shops. Yeah. They just probably thought we were nuts. Yeah. We'd try to do it outside the most. most we were always years. respectful. And if we were there for a long time, we'd continue buying more pastries yeah. and whatever with our very little money. It's yeah. hilarious how it's not hilarious, but it's incredible to just think about how little money we had and we're bringing in, but it all worked really well. Yeah. We didn't have rent, bills, anything to pay for. We weren't doing any kind of crazy entertainment. And we weren't dry, like we weren't traveling much. Like we would go a few hundred miles very infrequently, like every few months or something. We learned how to eat well too, so that we would eat very fueling foods so that we wouldn't be eating just a bunch of 
expensive processed we stuff. got skinny though we did get like basic. i got skinny it was i sure. mean it was also a lot of stress on our bodies yeah. to be doing something so crazy and new and we were experimenting too with eating vegan which i didn't really work that well for me i don't think mm-hmm. it was cool like for, well and then we worked on the farm at that point too which was awesome because we got like a ton of uh free veggies just for like a little bit of labor every week but i felt really clear and good for the first like couple months of eating exclusively like veggies because we were bringing in more veggies than we had ever eaten and they were all so good like Mm -hmm. you couldn't get vegetables that were that like hearty and full of nutrients from the grocery store so yeah we would eat in eating those i felt really good but i lost some weight and i was like pretty thin at that point so i've had to like figure out how to balance that with my diet this is big fast forward but yeah sorry no 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 i'm about to big fast forward now that we've had land and stability and we're not moving and we don't have those kind of weird stressors happening it's a different type of stress baron talks about it in his book that's going to be coming out very soon but it's a different type of stress bigger spikes of stress but less frequent and then you've got all these weird little stressors happening of course as compared to typical like normal life right but now that we've had land it's like our bodies have settled and our uh, just physiologically we've settled we've also been able to eat local meat and preserve it in even just a cooler but we're so close to meat now that we can bring that into our diets and we both put on healthy amounts of weight and muscle, and it's been just really interesting to observe how our bodies have changed over these last five years. Yeah, because traveling is, like, it sounds... Um, Wee! Yeah, but it's stressful trying to figure out, especially when you have no money and you're looking at free camping only, and you were, like, scraping by on gas, and it's like, well, we got to stay here for a week so that we can, like, get the paycheck in from launching the website that we're working on or okay but why would we do that why would why did we live like that with no money why what do you mean why would anybody want to just because because that's scary to think of oh you're gonna go live on the road and you're not gonna make any money why would you want to do that well we so why there's a good why but to kind of like put it into context we had gotten used to the sort of feast and famine um sort of paradigm from working for ourselves for a long time so especially i feel like your money was always more like constant with face painting and stuff but with mine it was like we would build maybe one or two new websites every month if that and depending on how much money we were getting paid for the website it was like maybe we would get like on the high end like fifteen thousand dollars between my buddy and i But then that would have to last like three months, you know? So we kind of got used to having to budget and be frugal. And like, yeah, it sometimes it felt like I had a lot of money in my bank account, but like that was all for the next couple months, you know? So we kind of got used to that sort of dealing with that anxiety coming from that lack of stability. So then in the scamp, it was like we had to... We had to make, we didn't have to make as much money and all the money that we did make went further. So then it was a better situation than trying to outrun rent and gas and everything like driving downtown to work. And so it, even though it was stressful, it was like a different kind of stress than our normal stress in the city. And we got to live in awesome places. So it was whenever we were dealing with stressful times. We could like go outside and go on a hike in a beautiful place or whatever. And it just felt really nice. It's also a little bit weird to admit that we were so broke. Culturally, it seems like that's kind of a taboo to say yeah. that you don't have any money. But I felt like we were living a more like what I would perceive as being a successful life. In, when we had that little money in the scamp versus when we were making more money in the city. I, I would also, prefer, you know, like I think that's more successful. Yeah, true. In my mind. We also always had, I don't think there was ever a time that we had less than $5,000 in savings. So we always had a backup kind of floater 
amount, but once it dips under that amount, I tried to maintain that ever since college. Just, I am, I don't know if this is real, but I'm a tourist, so I feel like I like to save money. I'm not about material stuff, but if I don't have a stockpile, like a squirrel, I feel really unsafe. <laughs> so I very much, if we were dipping into that, and it went yeah. below that 5,000, we had some stress happening. Yeah, but you was, would get hyper-stressed. Because it was a big shift to be yeah. going from stability and making money, which was never exactly stable, like you just said. It was mm. always contract work. But to then jump into something new and not know how we were going to be making money, not know what YouTube was going to pay. We still never know what YouTube will pay out every month. It's always changing. Any videos that you ever see that say, this is how much so-and-so makes on YouTube, they're just like never ever wrong yeah never ever wrong i mean right or yeah never, never right. right always there, wrong yeah it, there's like a range though mm -hmm. but like even month to month sometimes a video will do great and and by do great i just mean like views wise because mm -hmm. that's what correlates to how much money it makes that spikes up the income and then other times the collective channel doesn't have those big spikes and income is way lower yeah you can't ever know it's never, ever constant. The, the most constant, like, cool thing about YouTube, though, I think, and, and especially for us, is I feel like we have a really strong community with our YouTube channel. Like, everybody that we meet, most of the comments and emails and everything that we get are just awesome, like, super cool people that, like, have a similar mindset to us. So what's cool about that is even with, and this is now kind of jumping into the future, so maybe we'll rewind here in a second, but we can hopefully like continue with that community going forward and have like a lot more retreats and that kind of thing and like bring that community from the digital realm into reality. Give that 20%, 80% of our energy. Yeah. The 80, 20 rule. My dad will be very happy about that. <laughs> Pareto's law. <laughs> or is it Occam's razor? I don't know. It's but, Terry. Yeah. Terry's. TP. Yeah. TP's. <laughs> TP's theorem. <laughs> we so. started making money, good money on YouTube after we had an unexpected massive snowstorm where we got over 20 inches of snow in two days on Thanksgiving Day. And it was one of those times where the, you never get as much snow as the forecaster says you're going to get. And that was a time where we did. We got every inch that that forecaster said we were going to get. Because it hadn't snowed at all. And it was no, mid-November. Is that right? Thir Thanksgiving is usually, I think, the third week. Yeah. But up to that point, there had been no snow. So to think that we're going to get hammered with like two feet in two days was just kind of crazy. What happened, though, is that forecast was for the town, and we were up deep in the mountains. Oh, right. So we got hit with some yeah. snow. But everybody loved us suffering and being desperate. But it wasn't that desperate. We've talked about this before, but like... We were only, what, six miles from town, but it seemed like we were way out there. And I had my sandals, like I had a decent pair of leather boots, but I was wearing my sandals because my boots would track in so much And you get snow, snow in the leather laces. Right. And then they take forever to dry. So it was just easier when I needed to go pee outside to just put on my sandals. But people just thought I was a total moron. And we drove to town because you want to be making tracks on that snow so that you don't just... Once it's done, you can't, you're stuck in there. Because it, you, if you don't have enough clearance to like push through the snow at that point, then you can't get out. So we drove to town intentionally, got Bear in a pair of boots, loaded up on some extra groceries, but we were already solid. We'd gone to the store the day before. And we had plenty of wood. So we could have la we could have just stayed at the scamp until the snow melted out. But, and it melted out so, so quick. But yeah. within like five days, it was a very doable amount of snow. Right. But then, so that was a big sort of spike for the YouTube channel. Like I think in the next, those next few videos got a lot of views and we gained a lot of subscribers at that time. We got on a lot of people's radar for really legitimately living in a trailer in winter climate. I think there hadn't been a ton of people who really were doing that at that time. And I don't know how many people really do now. It's not very easy and oftentimes it's not very nice. Well, there are, I feel like at that time we were one of the few like winter camping, like we were doing that consistently. Like Brian, our buddy was one of the first two, 
but I really don't think at that time there were a lot of people doing it. And I don't want to act like, oh, we were the first, but there were very few people on YouTube winter camping. So then when we made a gnarly winter camping video in the mountains, it was pretty novel. As a couple in a teeny tiny trailer with a teeny tiny wood stove. Yeah. It was just very new. And Whereas now we can't like get away with that as much. Like our winter camping videos don't gain as much traction because there are lots of people. Yeah, it's not cool anymore. That have a van or It's whatever. more like, well, you guys are dumb. Why are you doing that? Right. Whereas before it was, how are you doing that? Right, right. But yeah, now that market's sort of saturated, so we have to find a new thing. And that's kind of like homesteading oriented, I guess, which... Thankfully, it seems like most of you guys really dig the homesteading stuff. And we were kind of um, fearful of people being like, dang, they're not in the scamp anymore. So it's not exciting. But it seems like people are more stoked that we're working on stuff and building our sort of dreams than we anticipated. So that's sweet. I also think that I guess we're jumping forward but i mean this is where we're at now in the story we've kind of told everything the way that's, that we were making money on yeah. youtube but by our intention is to build a really neat and interesting home that has not been built in the way that we're going to do it and we are using our friends james and doreen uh their kind of method of building with cement and cement blocks and i think and i hope that by doing something unique we will have a lot of uh interest yes interest and engagement in our youtube channel going forward and if not there's still going to be youtube videos of it and i bet <laughs> <Yeah>. anybody who's <laughs> still listening to this podcast I, I bet that you will like it yeah and we appreciate you dedicated audience for being here because in my mind so when we got into living in the scamp so at first before we lived in the scamp and you were doing body painting and everything all of it was like the intention or like the final goal was this, to have land and be able to have a community space and invite people out and have retreats and that kind of thing. But all of the in-between living in the scamp and doing face painting and all those things were the necessary steps to get us here. So hopefully wherever people are in their path, they can jump onto where we are or where we were in that path and then um, leverage that to learn from and then get to, I don't know, whatever similar or dissimilar spot you want to get to. Because we were saving or we were didn't have many expenses as YouTube started picking up to an amount per month that was like very average for I think most people, we were able to save all of that money every month because we had very little outgoing money. Because we'd gotten used to living on a few hundred dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Great training, because then we were able to afford to buy this land in cash. And I think without that, we could have never gone from our jobs in Kansas City to 40 acres of land. Not saying that in order to buy 40 acres of land, you have to live in a 13-foot trailer for five years. But it worked for us. Yeah. It might work for other people, And by too. making those sacrifices that people would perceive as sacrifices for that long, then we could save up that amount of money. Otherwise, there's no chance we ever could. That's what we were struggling with in Kansas City is it was just so hard to save money because you were just bleeding out every day and going out to eat and everything because I would just be so busy working throughout the day that I would just go eat lunch out and it'd be, you know, 15, 20 bucks just to eat lunch and then to try to like outpace that was just really difficult. We were just working in order to afford our lives. Mm -hmm. No time. No time. Whereas now we have more time. And enough time that I'm starting a new craft that I think will be of interest to some of you. Can we talk about it? I don't see why not. I'm going to finally, freaking finally get into metalsmithing. I've wanted to do this. I took a couple classes in college. I took a class in high school. I've just never had the money or space to be able to get a kit because, gosh, there's so much uh, 
stuff that you have to have. And Baron's been very supportive, wanting me to do this because he knows that I want to. Mm -hmm. And I've been very, um, I haven't gotten a ton of stuff, just the basics, but I'm excited to move forward and be able to sell some jewelry. I think that'll be a really fun way to continue bringing in income. Mm -hmm. Because with YouTube being so inconsistent, we definitely, we absolutely know that we can't rely on YouTube forever. That's just, it, that's just the way it is. I mean, maybe, but we're expecting not. So we want to try to find ways that we can make money outside of YouTube and use YouTube to send people to our... Other things. Right. Like once we get this land established, we would really love to, not even necessarily on our land, but just in the area host meetups, um, retreats, kind of, not necessarily come and relax type retreat, but come and learn, learn how to tan hides, learn um, even how to, oh, I've really just wanted to host workshops on building, come build a tiny house with us on our land, things like that, because then people could use the tiny house once it's done and come be out here and have um just an experience. We want to share the experience that we've had with people. Even building out nomadic rigs, like vans and trailers and that kind of thing too. There's so many options and opportunities to go forward here on this land. And we will figure out what works once we kind of get our own selves safely situated. It's kind of like home. when you're on a plane, you got to put your oxygen mask on before you put it on your kid. That's the same sort of, we got to get everything dialed. But you really want to put it on your kid. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, so we want to, and we have been including people to the best of our ability out here, but we that's our end goal. But we kind of have to establish it a little bit so that we can start having everybody out all the time. Oh, also, this is not something that I make money on. But I finally, oh, I finished my blanket. I'll show it Yay. on YouTube. It's huge. I know it is. I'm big. so glad that's done. <laughs> yeah. Elsa had a big old bag just full of crochet equipment floating around the scamp for what a year now. I'm an artist. Yeah. Tight. And your show your watercolor. That is so cool. I think if we made prints of these watercolor, uh, I don't know, paintings I that you've been know. doing, I think that would be so cool. I have to get better. And so watercolor prints or photography prints, if you're, if that sounds like interesting, an interesting thing for us to sell on our websites, let us know. Cause I mean, I don't we might as well try be. to sell prints if, if I don't know. But if people know. are interested, I just don't know that people would be interested. Right. What I'd love to do is make a photo book of our scamp travels, kind of a chronological photo book. I think that would be fun. Mostly just selfishly. I would like that. And then in my book, we will have a lot of photography too. So that'll be cool because it'll be fun. Just yes. To flip and through. that is part of the, this whole thing is that is something that he's been working on for years, literal years. And it is finally in its final stages. Oh, it's, I, when I read it, I just think, how did you do this? How did you cover all of this? It's not only the practical stuff, but also the mental stuff, just things that I wouldn't have thought to, to cover, to put into a book. And I think people, nomad or not, are going to find this book fascinating. I hope so. It's taken a long time. But it's not like I've been working on it every day for that long. It's been whenever we have a gap where I can really focus in. Because it takes a lot of my mental to work on it, you know? I don't know of anyone else in my sphere of people who have taken the time to write a book and now seeing all the work that it takes that you've put into it, I don't ever want to write a book. I didn't really either. And it's not like it's some novel or something. It's just like a sort of handbook. But yeah, I'm not like a trained writer or anything. It was just... You I wouldn't know. I was writing blog posts and stuff and then it sort of started molding into, wow, I wish that I knew all of this as we were getting into nomadic living. So then I was like, might as well bring it together and share it with people. I thought it'd be something that I could just cobble together quick. But then as I started working on it, I was like, man, I can't just like release it half 
mm-hmm. done, you know? And over the years, you've added so much to it from just more experience. Yeah. And then sort of honed in some of the ideas and things with... Because when I first started writing, and I was pretty uh, contentious, I guess, kind of frustrated with cultural systems and everything from having been in the city and for so long and then having escaped that, I could see how much being in those systems and dealing with all of that was just killing me and stressing me out. So I was really frustrated by that and trying to like throw a lifeline to all my friends and family and being like, guys, like, look, you got to get out here. You got to, cause that is not working, but it was like, people didn't see it and didn't like grab the raft or like jump on the trail with us, which just kind of boggled my mind because it was like, look, we're proving it. Like you can do this and I'll show you how, like, why don't you also do it? So I was pretty pissed off. Now looking back, we very much understand why people didn't want to move into a trailer. Yeah. But it was frustrating, like seeing all that and then seeing people still be stuck in a rut and not being able to help them. That just drove me nuts. But I kind of like, took the edge off of that eventually and just was like, whatever people want to do what they want to do. I can't, I can't help them. You know, you can, and you do. Well, I mean, you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped or if they don't want to do anything different then like you can't force them to, Mm -hmm. and it's wasted energy to force them to. And now that's what I'm realizing is that there are so many people that would love any help that I could give them. So then I need to focus my energy on those people and not try to like force, like help people that don't want that Mm -hmm. or that aren't receptive to it, I guess. And we're just getting closer and closer to being able to do that. And at least we have the podcast and YouTube videos currently for anyone to take whatever they want from. And in the future, hopefully it will be more in real life type stuff. Yeah. It will be. And then also we've kicked around the idea of merch forever. And that's just like t-shirts and hats and that kind of stuff. But there's no, or it's really hard to find a sustainable or quality like t-shirt manufacturer or hat manufacturer. Most of the hats, no matter where you buy them from, are made in like, um, it's a company called Yupong. And they're, I think they're either Korean or Vietnamese. But Bangladesh? Yeah, Bangladesh, that's what it is. And that's where, like, I don't know, a lot of the branded hats that you see that are, like, designed in wherever, they're really made there, and then they ship them over. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. Like, I wouldn't not work with them, but it's just I would love to work with a company that's, like, hand-making hats or making them in, like, a with living wages and stuff, you know? U.S. made even. Yeah. U.S. sourced. I don't know, but also the struggle too is we can't have very many shirts. We can't have very many hats. So we don't want to just go give people more hats and more shirts and just put just more, more stuff out into the world with our name on it. Yeah, we want it to be quality if we're going to sell anything like that. So we've kicked around the idea of like merino shirts with some cool designs on them and stuff. And you actually did that with mm-hmm. those tank tops, got mm-hmm. uh, screen printed tank tops with. Um, that were made out of merino. And I that was sold really them cool. for like what the shirt cost because yeah. I was so afraid nobody would buy them. So if you have one of those, that's cool. Yeah, you got a good deal on it. <laughs> but we would like to do something like that. But if there are, I don't know, if anybody has ideas um, for things that we could like design and sell or. Um, we're considering um, rumple blankets, currently talking to them. That we are the are... down, like sort of sleeping bag material blankets that they're they're really nice we want to do merch that we very much love and use like swiss army knives doing some sort of a logo on a swiss army knife but then it's like we don't want to just make stuff just to bring in money just to sell stuff just to make fast money we don't i mean that's why we've never done it we could do it so easily yeah. It would be cool though with a merino shirt to have a shirt that's like represents something cool, you know? And then the merino shirts sort of follow our ethos of minimalism because it's one t-shirt that you can replace a bunch of t-shirts with. 
So I think that's a cool thing, but then trying to deal with all the complexity of different sizes and all that is difficult too. That's why hats are kind of attractive because you can do like a one size fits most sort of deal. I also have talked to a guy that makes custom like full tang knives, like fixed blade knives, and that would be kind of neat to do like our design sort of in a knife. But honestly, the thing that we use a lot more than fixed blade knives is multi-tools. So, and there are plenty of multi-tools that work. And our little, on our keys, we both have the little Victorinox uh, Swiss Army knives. And that's probably our most used tool. But it doesn't seem like we could just buy a bunch of those and put our logo on them and sell them. And that might be cool. But also it's like, why why do that? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, it's not tough. unique. We're considering also doing um, journals, making a either or both blank journal, small, um, with some sort of unique design on the front, and then a uh, a journal that's more of like uh, prompts, journaling prompts, like, like monthly. Bullet journal-ish. Yes, but that's just so specific to yeah. people that it's hard to make a prompted journal, and it, it, it would it's easier to just make a blank journal. It'd be but interesting. But then again, we want it to be a quality company, and so far... We've only found a couple and haven't moved forward. It'd be kind of cool if I made one with prompts that were interesting to me and you made one with prompts that are interesting to you and they could... There's really no reason not to. Yeah. Somebody will find that interesting. We're just not very good at wanting to make money. We yeah. need to make money because we need money to do the things that we want to do. But it's not uh, something that we... It's not an enjoyable process to go out and just do things to make money. I don't get a lot of fulfillment when I get a check. It's like, okay, if I have enough money to like get by and live relatively comfortably, then I'm happy. Anything in excess of that is like, I'm not, it doesn't make me super excited there's and I should probably change that up, honestly. There's a certain amount of money that once you exceed that amount of money, it's something like a hundred grand a year or something close to that. Once you start making more than that, your quality of life goes down because you don't have to fight anymore. And then you're continuing to work to get more and more and more. There's, I don't know, maybe Google that. There's some sort of. There's like diminishing returns and then it like flips. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 70 grand or something like that. I don't know. And I'm not saying that that's where I'm at, but it's just like, I, if I have enough money to live frugally and have the tools that I need to have a fun time and gear that I need to have a fun time, then I'm totally content. But I could, I don't know, work harder at that. Another potential avenue that we've talked about is with my book being finished, one, I want to get the book done clearly. And then once it's finished in the digital form, then, and this is something that I'm struggling with talking about digital form, is... So I prefer like the EPUB format because you can open that on any iPad or e-reader device. It's like an open source sort of format almost. So that's the book format and it's like sizable, like you can adjust the size of the text and everything. But some people don't know how to interface with EPUBs, so they would prefer PDFs. So then the PDF is all the same size though. So it's hard to... I would have to size a PDF that would flow to different phones and everything, and that's really difficult. And then the Kindle people need a .mobi file for their Kindles, which functions exactly like an EPUB, but it's a proprietary format that Kindle has. So trying to figure out how to bridge all of those gaps has been kind of difficult. But once I get that done, then I'll record the audio version, and then I think it'd be cool to work that into a sort of course that we both work on together and use that as our sort of rubric to develop a course around that. Because we have so much nomad life experience just in these last five years. I feel like we have a lot to share. And I was kind of thinking that, oh, now we have land. Now we have to leave the nomad scene. But we have so much knowledge and tips and things that we've picked up from living that way that... It would be a shame to just let all of that information sit in our brains. Yeah. Could help somebody. Totally. Speaking of nomads, we have a couple of nomad friends staying on our land right now. 
Brad and Lindy, hopefully going to become neighbors soon. We'll see. But we are supposed to be making a roast in the uh, Instant Pot, a venison roast for the first time, and it's getting late. So we need to get to that. Cool. Let's do it. Do you have any closing remarks? I don't think so. What's that one quote about um, needing less? I think that would be a good thing to end this on. Um, the definition of, is it wealth? If the definition of being wealthy is having more than you need, then the easiest way to become wealthy is to learn to need less. Something to that effect. Need very little. Yeah, need very little. And that was, Derek Sivers taught us that. And that's kind of that frugality is freedom mantra that we learned and adopted early in this is figure out how to operate on very little. And then as you begin to make money, then all of that is like excess. So then you can use that however you please. Well, cool. thanks for tuning in and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye.